the start of what I hope will be a very informative video series in which I will show you some historically important experiments in nuclear chemistry, right up to nuclear fission. This video series will show many experiments, which I strongly advise against replicating. Even if this might be possible in some cases, do not try this outside a special nuclear laboratory. I will give a brief summary of the findings obtained so far, but today I will focus primarily on what I would call the first nuclear chemistry experiment. Uranium containing minerals have been known for centuries. Uranium had previously been isolated based on its color, so I don't count this as the first nuclear chemistry experiment as it was not isolated from pitch blender with the knowledge of its radioactivity. In 1896 radioactivity was discovered by Antoine-Henri Becquerel using uranium as an example. At that time there were no further explanations. At the time of Madame Skłodowska curies experiments, Rutherford was investigating the nature of this radiation without really knowing exactly where it came from, as the theory of the atomic nucleus had not yet been published. And now we skip some steps and come to Marie Skłodowska Curie. In 1896, using an electrometer, she discovered that the amount of radioactivity depends only on the uranium content in the sample, and that this radiation therefore comes directly from the uranium and is not the result of some weird chemical interactions between molecules. In 1897, through systematic investigation of minerals such as pitch blender and tobenite, she was able to prove that a certain amount equivalent to uranium is significantly more active than the same amount of pure uranium. She discovered shorter lived decay products. Now she was hooked. Okay, I left out a few details, but it's time to search for these decay products. One of them is polonium and today we are going to recreate the method she used back then to isolate this element from pitch blender. For radiation safety reasons I cannot directly replicate her experiment. The good lady took 100 grams of pitch blender and then later realized that she would need a few tons. We are doing this on a milligram scale. We have to tweak the residue, which I will explain in more detail in the video on radium, for the Curie separation process to polonium in order to make the observations that she first made. We need 25% hydrochloric acid, which is added to 100 milligrams of pitch blender powder. To ensure that everything soluble is actually dissolved, I added a few drops of concentrated nitric acid. The separation process I show is the classic Curie separation process for polonium. A chemical separation process basically only distinguishes between soluble compounds and insoluble compounds. At the beginning you have several elements available and in this case you focus on polonium. All you really do is look, is the polonium soluble or insoluble in this state? Is it soluble? Then get rid of the residue. Add a new chemical and check again. And this way the elements are separated from each other piece by piece using increasingly specific separation methods until ideally only the element of interest remains at the end. In the case of such highly radioactive elements, an accompanying element, a carrier, is needed because the radioactive element is not available in sufficient quantities. Silicates, for example, are not dissolved in the acids I used and then can just be decanted off. We will also look at this residue in another video on productinium and actinium. The following carriers are now added to the solution for color effect. 15 mg of lead nitrate, 10 mg of copper sulfate and 4 mg of bismuth hydroxide. The solution gradually turns slightly greenish due to copper. At that time, hydrogen sulfide was bubbled through. In my setup I'm simply using sodium sulfide solution, but more or less the same. The precipitate must be thoroughly centrifuged. More sodium sulfide is added until nothing more precipitates. That was really annoying as the sulfide is really fine and sticks to pretty much everything. You can track the procedure because at the end you want to have a clear yellow solution. The yellow color comes from uranium and there is also some thorium present which remain in the solution. Uranyl does not form polysoluble sulfides, but everything else pretty much does. The yellow uranyl solution is decanted and saved for the next video. What remains is a mixed sulfide precipitate. Since we don't have any arsenic, antimony and ammonium sulfide at the moment and I really don't want to make it any more toxic than it already is. I will have to skip this step. The precipitate is dissolved in approximately 20% nitric acid by just shaking it. This converts all the heavy metal ions into a soluble form and once again it stinks 
quite badly. The somewhat clear solution contains the dissolved polonium and is mixed with 4 molar sulfuric acid, primarily to precipitate out the lead carrier. The first sulfate precipitate is the mass from which Curie later extracted the radium, as radium and barium also precipitate out here. Here I also added 10 mg of barium carrier as preliminary tests showed that otherwise the amount of radium contained will cause problems later in the spectrum. After centrifuging the lead barium radium sulfate residue, the solution with polonium bismuth and copper is then washed again with sulfuric acid. The sulfuric acid is then mixed with ammonia solution. Here you can see the beautiful formation of the deep blue tetraamine copper complex which is also a great indicator for us when the solution is alkaline. The whole thing is then centrifuged and at the top we have the tetraamine copper solution and at the bottom we have a yellow residue. I just wanted to show you this because we started with bismuth trihydroxide which is white and ended up with a yellow solid. You might be familiar with this yellow color coming from bismuth sulfide in the 5 plus oxidation state. Nice digression. However, the tetraamine solution should actually not be centrifuged for a functioning measurement on the alpha spectrometer. Even by evaporating the suspension, the preparation ends up too thick for any measurements. This last suspension should better be just sucked off with a membrane filter. I then dried it with a lamp and measured. And lo and behold, we really did extract polonium from pitch blender. That was enough for me because it was a hell of a job, but not for Marie Curie. To prove that you really have a new element, a mixed compound with bismuth is not enough. You need pure polonium. How do you separate polonium from bismuth? Even though they are quite similar, Curie found them easier to separate than radium from barium for example. They noticed that when pitch blend is heated, very active material can be resublimated. Accordingly, the sulfide was then heated to 700 degrees Celsius in a vacuum. In the colder areas, the polonium settled at around 250 to 300 degrees C and on the hotter areas the bismuth settled. This is how pure polonium was first detected. The publication was originally written in French in July 1898 and due to its similarity to bismuth it was suggested that it be classified here in the periodic table. Which is absolutely correct. The periodic table I show here is from 1871, meaning that at the time polonium was published there were a few more elements. Today there are more efficient ways to make polonium available, but that was not the point of this video. I wanted to show you what observations Marie Skłodowska curie probably made at the first time doing this experiment. The observations were probably even more colorful because she had a lot more material. Before I finish this video, I repeated the experiment for this video many times and it took me half a year and now there are a few subtleties to note. The amount of bismuth added should not be 15 milligrams, but rather 4 milligrams. Then you won't see anything, but it works much better. Not seeing anything in a video would not be ideal for a video. 2 to 4 milligrams of copper is also quite sufficient. It is quite possible that a residue remains after this sulfide precipitation step, which is not even soluble in concentrated nitric acid. This flake can be discarded. Any polonium present has already dissolved. The sulfate precipitation step with the barium carrier must be repeated more than once and each time barium carrier must be added yet again and completely precipitated otherwise there will be way too much radium and its daughter in the alpha spectrum later. And of course I would like to point out the usual dangers of working with toxic gases and radioactive heavy metals. These notes from the last few minutes were intended for my friends in other nuclear laboratories in the case this experiment might become a practical experiment for teaching purposes. A special thanks goes to the Working Group of Analytics and Fundamental Nuclear Chemistry from Dr. Eric Strupp and the Division of Nuclear Chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.